Happy Sunday, Teach Better Nation. It's Brad Hughes from the Teach Better team, along with Ray Hewitt, your co host for our favorite night of the week. It's the Sunday weekly warm up, streaming exclusively in our private Teach Better group on Facebook. It's also streaming later. It's also going to be a podcast. It's going to magically turn into an incredible panel discussion tonight and for all time on all of the major media. And we have some major fun in store tonight with our panel. We're looking forward to digging in with Jen Manley, Ashley Hubner, and Dr. Dave Schmidow. We'll be back right after this break to dig into some deep discussion on data or data. Ray, thank you. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Sunday weekly warm-up streaming exclusively in the private Teach Better group on Facebook. My name is Brad Hughes, Teach Better team member, along with my co-host, the co-host with the most, Ray Hewart. Good evening, Ray, and how are you doing? I'm good. I'm so glad that we get to host this show together every single week, and you know, Brad, and if you've caught on to the show and you've been following it all year long, you know, I love these panel discussions. So guys, thank you so much for joining our panel for January and so excited to continue our panel theme uh, as many times as we can throughout the month as we can head into 2023. Ray, I would like, I would, I'd love to hear about your weekend and I'd love to introduce our guests as well. So Ray, if you can kick us off, how was your weekend and what's been keeping you busy uh, leading up to the Sunday? Yeah, no, it's been a great weekend. Uh, mix of little bit of work. We were traveling last week. Dr. Dave Schmidow and I were in New Orleans together for FETC. So a little bit of recovery this weekend. And then, I don't know, like a six-year-old birthday party, which is always a blast. You know, shout out to those mermaid themes. <laughs> Excited to get into today's discussion. Brad, before I hear about your weekend, I think it'd be good to to update our panelists here. Dave, do you mind introducing yourself and sharing a little bit about what you do in education? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm actually still fixated on Brad's introduction. He's totally sounded like Fozzie Bear with a waka waka waka, but it was a welcome, welcome, welcome. So a little blast from my childhood past there. That was that was pretty good, Brad. Um, I am Dave Schmidt, Director of Leadership and Development on the Teach Better team. I get to, to hang out with amazing educators all over the country on a regular basis and just learn from them, steal from them, and deposit seeds of wisdom whenever we can. So super excited to be here tonight and hang out with everybody on this Sunday evening. So good. Ashley, I know you were with us as well in New Orleans. Do you want to head next? Sure. I'm Ashley Hubner. I'm an instructional coach and curriculum specialist. I work with uh, school districts and curriculum companies to develop um instructional capacity within products and within teacher professional development. So yeah, what just left FBTC also it was a fun trip. New Orleans was a blast, but I'm glad to be here with y'all tonight also. So fun. And Ashley, I know you're also part of our Edupreneur Mastermind, which Jen is also a part of and also a part of our speakers network. So so many good connections here. Jen, do you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Jen Manley. I am a former um, middle and high school teacher. I now currently teach at the college level, and I also support educators in um, better using planning time so that they are able to be efficient and effective um, while still having work-life balance. Man, such a good powerhouse panel here, Brad, that you put together. I'm so excited for this. Brad, how was your weekend? Great weekend, Ray. Uh, we actually we actually head to uh, London, Ontario on Friday night. And we took in Disney on ice. It was just absolutely delightful. Uh, huge Disney fans in our house. And if you think of all of the Disney magic mixed with sort of an ice capades or an ice show and, and finding a way to uh, bring Disney magic to life uh, right on the ice, we had rinkside seats and the delight of the kids and families around us was just, just marvelous. So we've had a wonderful uh, weekend, a little bit of uh, schoolwork, a little bit of family time, uh, some TV, some walks in the snow, very snowy here in southwestern Ontario this weekend. We had uh, four or five days of uh, some serious snow. So uh, a winter wonderland here, Ray. And uh, I'm wondering about uh, how Jen, Ashley, and Dave might have spent their weekend. And I'd like to know more about where in the world these folks are. Cool. Well, well I, I think... At 
Oh, I was oh, gonna say, goodness. Ashley and I did. Ashley and I did not experience any of that snow, so no. I, I'm not really sure what you're talking about. Um, I, I'm enjoying the, the sun just set, and there are dolphins playing in the Gulf of Mexico out there. So, uh, Ashley, is it the same where where you are? Yeah, I think it was uh, in the 70s today, maybe 76. We went on a family walk around the neighborhood. It was very nice. Oh my gosh! Played in the tree. <laughs> I had so much snow. Jen, what about you? Yeah, we haven't really had any snow all year. I'm in Maryland. So um, typically our big snow month is February. So we're still holding out to see if we're going to get any. But yeah, it was 55 today. And to me, that's warm for January. So we also enjoyed a, a nice outdoor walk. Brad, I think it's just you and me. We had like six inches of snow and it's been snowing on and off for the last three days here in Chicago. So I guess I need to travel more and enjoy these warm areas. Well, I've got great news. It, uh, there's been a sighting in our neighborhood of the uh, very rare and, and coveted snow dolphin. I mean, not to compete with uh, Dave seeing the dolphins in the Gulf of Mexico. The snow dolphin is uh, really a sought after and a very rare uh, species that's seen in very locally here in Ontario and uh, uh, snow dolphin or polar bear or however you get around to the snow ray it uh, between uh, you and Chicago area and me in Ontario we've had our fair share of snow but it always is nice to live vicariously through uh, our colleagues like Ashley and Dave who are enjoying fun in the sun year round. Oh, so good. Well, I guys, I know we have a big discussion we're going to get into. So we're ready to dive in here to our panel discussion. Before we transition, Brad, we tell us a little bit about this theme this this month. Absolutely. Focusing on doing data better, thinking about how we gather data in cycles of instruction to better inform what we do with and for our students, and always keeping in mind that behind the data, there are human beings, someone's kids our kids. And so personalizing the data and making sure that we are avoiding pitfalls that take us away from the real heart of education, which is to gather information to improve discussion. So we're trying to figure out how we might do data better, Ray, and what better to who better to dig in than uh, with Jen, Ashley and Dr. Dave. I have to tell you, friends, I feel like some people in the comments are going to be like, yippee, and some people are going to be like, ah, data, that sounds terrible. We'll be right back to see which one you fall into. <laughs> Welcome back to our Sunday weekly warm-up panel and shout out to Janelle in our comments who says, ooh, I love this. Janelle is ready for this hot topic, which is data-driven instruction and how to do data better. Ray. Can we first discuss the data data thing? Dave, we have to talk about it. Ashley, Jen, I don't know where you fall, but if you could be on my team for this, it would be really helpful. So I need people in the comments to share their thoughts, data versus data. And then I really would love to hear everyone's thought. We just got to put it out there because we're about to say it like 1,500 times in the next 20 minutes. Any thoughts? Ashley, Jen? Are we gonna, like, are we going to vote? Um, I say data, but maybe it's a Southern thing because I'm from Texas. <laughs> It's simply uh, a right thing. That's all it is. You're Jen, right. Jen says too. Jen, are you a data? I am also data. So, Brad, which are you? It depends if I'm watching Star Trek. If if, if I've got some science fiction on, it's going to be data. Uh, but uh, when I'm talking with educators, it's probably data or data. Probably two or three different switch ups in any given sentence or paragraph. <laughs> I just can't make up my mind. Okay, so it's three people that are for sure data, one person who plays in both camps, and then I'm data all the way, guys. I'm so sorry. I guess we'll just complete, com like, continue confusing Ray, each other. Right. Have you ever told your mom that you're on Team Dad Dad? Like, how does she feel about that, that you choose Dad Dad over Mama? <laughs> I like, don't. I, that's what I hear when I hear Dad Dad. I think, like, daddy issues. So it's data. It's data. Data, data. No, it just data sounds aggressive. No, maybe I, think, that's why I hate talking about data. There you go. That's it. Whatever. Maybe, maybe we should ask a kindergarten literacy teacher because I think like 
with the syllables, I think it is data. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna go text all of my my lip friends. Brad, you're gonna run this panel, right? I you go ahead. Well, as we dive into data or data and we think of data driven instruction, I'd I'd love to hear from our panelists what comes to mind when you hear those words, data driven instruction, especially as all educators are engaged in some way with gathering data about student learning and also about their own performance as educators and sometimes in high stakes ways, whether we're talking about big data or standardized testing or more personalized data. Jen, if I turn things over to you and then to Ashley, what comes to mind when you think of data-driven instruction? Well, I think about the information that teachers are able to gather on a day-to-day -day basis um, to inform what they're going to do the next day. I think, um, you know, data in general is kind of a buzzword in education and you know, you, you brought up standardized testing, and I think standardized testing is actually a terrible example of data for teachers, because for a lot of teachers, they're not actually getting that information until after the students have left their classroom. Um, so for me, and I think about, you know, teachers who are in the classroom, it's, it's a lot more approachable to think about data in the ways that we collect it and use it day to day, um, and how it it informs and transforms our instruction, um, you know, in the here and now, because, you know, that that is what teachers are dealing with most imminently um, in their profession. Ashley, what comes to mind for you in terms of how data and instruction might be linked? Um, I agree with Jen. I think it's an ongoing process, but I think there's so many different ways of looking at various data, de depending on what you're looking at. Um, I think if you're looking at a summative assessment, it drives what you change in the curriculum because, you know, the curriculum, what's tested, taught and aligned all needs to be, you know, triangulated. So, I mean, I really think it, if we're looking at data is to grow, is to learn and grow. What what knowledge can you gather out of it when you're analyzing it from what perspective? Um, I think of it as like a, a collective inquiry together through a PLC and there's different um, outcomes that you can use with that data, depending on what you're looking at. It may drive your, you know, small group instruction. It may drive your whole curriculum. You know, you may have to rewrite things or go back and fix things because you've created gaps based on the data. Um, so that's kind of what I think of is that it just, it drives everything depending on what you're doing. Dave, how do you make the link between, uh, how do you make the link for educators who hate data, but love kids? Well, so, so so many places to go with this one. First, I'm going to go back to what Jen said early on to help Ray with her search here. Jen, I love how you said it's day to day. Like you even use data in that, right? Day to day. It's not dad to day. It's day to day. Um, and Dave, I think just, just to confirm, I sent out a tweet. So Twitter will solve this problem, but go yeah, ahead. Because Twitter's never wrong. You're absolutely never. right. <laughs> yeah, I like that. If, in, in Canada, it's Delta. So we'll, we'll, we can use that if we'd, if we'd rather, but what, what I like to, to talk about is the fact that teachers have been using data since the beginning of time. Um, teachers don't necessarily even have a fear of data or a dislike of data. What they have is what a lot of kids have too. It's a, it's a fear of judgment. It's a fear of evaluation. It's a fear of somebody coming in and condemning based off of not having all of the answers and all of the information. It, teachers have always had to sit back at the end of the day and said, was today a good day or a bad day? They've always had to make those determinations. They've always had to say, what am I going to do tomorrow based off of what happened today? And we've always done that. But what has changed is we've now started to use that information and collect information in ways that seemingly nobody understands to make judgments that seemingly nobody thinks is fair. Mm -hmm. And that's the struggle. So we had to get teachers back to the, to the place of recognizing that they've always used data. They've always been okay with using data. And we just need to go back and continue to put that data on the table and have conversations around the, the stuff that matters to us already. When we think about using data to begin to gather information that will help us serve our students beginning exactly where they are, are there ways that we can unpack that process to, to draw the little humans into some understanding that it doesn't necessarily mean we're judging. It means that we're gathering some additional information and you can be an important part of that. Uh, Jen or Ashley, are there ways that we can draw students into and clear around, clear up any of the mysteries around at least the initial data we're gathering for instruction? You want me to go? 
Um, yeah, well, I used a lot of that in the classroom, um, did data tracking with students, talked to them one-on-one -on -one conferences about what the data meant, what it showed, what our goals are. Um, I always had students set goals at the beginning of the year. Um, and those goals to them may be, I just want to be a better reader or I want to learn two digit addition. You know, their, their goals are more in their language than what we look at when we look at numbers. But then how do you have those conversations with them to transform what they're doing on these assessments, what they're doing on tasks that correlates to what their goal is. And when you can communicate with them and have those conversations, then they see that it makes an impact. Um, and, you know, I've used class data charts, you know, to show, you know, here's our progress from beginning of the year to the middle of the year. Look how much we've grown. Look how much we've learned together. And so I just use it as a tool for them to one, have buy-in to what we're doing in the classroom, but also to celebrate their successes as we, as we move along. I think there's also something to be said about, um, and I, made me think of it when you were talking earlier, Dave. Um, data and education is not just quantitative data, it's also qualitative data. Um, and I think when teachers get overwhelmed thinking about data, they're thinking about charts, right? And numbers and these measurable things that are, that, that are quantifiable. Um, and Dave, when you were talking, you know, this idea of teachers are constantly collecting data and they're constantly, you know, making, um, notices and, and uh, you know, noticing what's going on around them, what's, what's going on with students. And I think the same thing can be true to working with students, right? So looking at um, something like mastery learning or um, a classroom that's a little bit more on the ungrading side, we can have those conversations about, okay, what do you know? And how do you know that you know, right? And, and shifting the conversation away from okay, you've earned an A on this particular assignment and saying, okay, looking at what we were supposed to learn, how, how do you know that you've mastered this objective or that you're moving towards mastery of this objective? How does that relate to what you did last week, right? These are all conversations around data that we can engage students in um, that doesn't look like the, the way that we might think of data in the traditional math sense. Dave, when we think about data points as sometimes revealing student struggles, are there ways that we can reassure students that the data we're gathering, even about their shortfalls or shortcomings, is going to serve them eventually? Yeah, but I, I would say that the, the trick is actually talking about how it can benefit them today. I think sometimes we get too caught up in talking about how things can benefit them in the long run when we have 8-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 15-year-olds that are truly just worried about what's going to happen to them at school today. So whenever we can mm -hmm. dial that back and talk about the present moment, I think we have more opportunities to get that buy-in. But I'll, I'll also talk about, you know, utilizing some of that data, data, data um, in our classroom and some of the, the stuff that we should be using with kids. I think sometimes in our quest to, to bring kids into the process, which I fully agree with, which I 100% believe in that process. I think sometimes we focus too much on, cerebral goals that we don't necessarily know how they can how they can grow into those as well for, so for example we'll tell a kid and that's high school level you scored a 25 on the act let's work on a 27 what do you actually have to do to go from a 25 to a 27 does anybody know we say things like study harder what does that mean can you actually just sit there and pontificate and think more to learn more no how do you go from a 1250 to a 1300 on the sat nobody knows how do you go from a, a 150 writ score to a 165 no clue other than think, think more. And so we, we put these abstract goals in front of kids oftentimes, and the kids have no idea what they're supposed to do to get there. So when we can take those abstract cerebral goals and turn them into more, I'll use a, a rayism here, tangible or tactical and practical things for the kids to be able to grasp. And we say, we want you to, to read 20 minutes a night. We want you to um, celebrate success on getting three answers correct in a row. And we can really break things down to things that are present day in the moment that we already know will have those long-term effects. Then we can look back and celebrate that success and celebrate the growth that we'll see because we already know that these things are going to have a, um, an, an immediate and a lasting impact on kids. Ray, I'm wondering what's coming to mind for you as you uh, hear Ashley, Dave, and Jen talk about the role of data and the role of bringing students into the data data gathering cycles. 
Yeah, no, I'm excited to dive into more of this in the action steps. You know, so many elements of what you've been sharing so far, I really wholeheartedly agree with. And Jen, I really value your suggestions that allow us to maybe take action as soon as tomorrow with how we can be better in this role. Dave, I think you're spot on on really trying to understand what you're looking for and better communicating that to students. And I think the other element, which is something I'm just experiencing in my personal life, is the students, when you when you are collecting data or data, the students then feel stress and finding ways to understand that just collecting information on students doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good or bad thing. And it really can just be for us to be better. I know so many students are stressing over state testing or stressing over, you know, some of these like massive high anxiety moments. And the reality is, is that anytime we're collecting information from students, whether it be quantitative or qualitative, we really need to allow students to understand that knowing that information makes us better. Just being aware of where we're at makes us better learners and better teachers because of it. When we think about data revealing what students need to continue to learn and do and improve on, doesn't data also reveal what we as educators similarly need to do differently? Is, is there a risk that we look at data as only evidence of student achievement or not, rather than educator practice? I'd love to hear from Ashley, Jen, or Dave. What do you think? Well, can I just jump in here while, while you guys think of your answer? I think sometimes teachers have fear that they may not, like, it's scary to collect data because if your students aren't doing well, you feel like you haven't done well. And there needs to be some weight off of that as well, because the reality is, is that the more we know, the better we are, right? And I don't know what your thoughts are, Jen. I see you unmuted. Yeah. Well, I, th I think about what you just said. And um, it's so funny because teachers are sometimes, it's, it's, it's a vulnerable thing to look at the data through the lens of, okay, this is what my students know, but it also reflects on what I'm doing as a teacher, what we're doing as a classroom. Um, but I think it's such an important step in, in modeling that reflection, um, especially when we're asking students, like you were talking about earlier, we're asking students to look at information and in a non-judgmental way, in a way where they can grow. And that is an incredibly vulnerable thing to ask students to do. Um, and so I think even though it's scary, even though you may not know exactly how to analyze the data or use the data, especially if, if you're starting this process, I think it's really important for teachers to reflect um, with their students, right? So reflect indiv individually, obviously, and then share what they've learned with students, um, giving students an opportunity to provide feedback, to provide insight. Um, again, like a very scary process, but if we want to have that happening in the classroom from the students, then I think it's really important for the teacher to be transparent, at least on some level, with kids about how how they're using data to reflect on their own process. Um, it reminds me of when I taught middle school, I used to use this mastery tracker for students um, to track where they felt they were in terms of their mastery of a certain objective. And to share it with them, to model it, I would track where I thought I was in my mastery of teaching that particular objective. And so I think it was cool for kids to see oh, she doesn't think that she's a master of this. She thinks that it's fluctuating day to day and that she's constantly moving towards mastery. And I think that that vulnerability helps kids to feel confident in using data to get better and not necessarily as um, a judgment tool for them. So I see Dave taking notes. So I want to go to him next. And I don't want to mess up the direction he's going. But Jen, you just sparked this next level, I think, of if students are supposed to be comfortable by giving data and, and feeling comfortable with it, and teachers are supposed to be comfortable collecting data, giving data, and being comfortable with it, then shouldn't our leadership also model collecting data and being comfortable with it? Sorry, Dr. Dave. Good luck with that one. <laughs> no, you're 100% correct. You know, oftentimes it's because we don't understand things that we tend to, to mess things up because we have to pretend like we do because we're in this world in education where we are used to, to people, little people coming to us for the answers all day long. So getting ourselves to the place where we have to say, I don't know, is scary. Whether you're a teacher 
having to say, I don't know, when you've been the expert on stage for seven hours a day, or now the administrator who's leading teachers that want you to have the answers saying, I don't know, is super scary. So what we tend to do is we take things that we don't understand and we try to boil them down to, to things that we think make sense. So for example, we use data a lot these days to make binary decisions. Are you a good teacher or a bad teacher? Are you a good student? Are you a bad student? Are you a gifted student or an at-risk student? Are you proficient or not proficient? Are you effective or ineffective? And very rarely can a single number, a single data point, a single anything tell us anything, anything close to anything in a binary level. You know, a, a lot of educators have heard me do this example. I'll do it really quickly um, just for our, our purposes right now. But if I, if I asked this panel really quickly to say, am I Dave Schmidt healthy? And give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Would you be able to answer that question? Some of you would say, yep, because of some of what you know. Some of you would say no, because of what you know. And some of you would say, I don't know, I need to know some information. So if I told you my weight and I said, I am 185 pounds, there's a number. Am I healthy? Well, I don't know. Tell us your cholesterol. My cholesterol is 190. Is that enough? I don't know. Tell us your blood pressure. And we can keep going. I can tell you a bunch of physical attributes. And then you'll say, okay, but that's just the physical. What about the social emotional? And I can keep going and going and going. And the reality is it's the same thing with our kids. The best data tells us that we need more data. It doesn't give us a judgment or a label, but that's what we've done with it. We've taken single data points to, to, plan, to, to cast blanket statements of binary judgment of got it, don't got it, yes, no, good, bad, whatever, as opposed to saying, where are you right now in the process? And that's what we as administrators should always be asking. Where is this person in the process? Knowing that there's always more to go, and they've, all, they've already come from somewhere, whether that's an administrator looking at a teacher, looking at a student, data tells us where you are in the process, not good or bad, not beautiful or ugly, but where are you today so we can get you somewhere better tomorrow? Brad, uh, isn't it good that he like wrote a book on this? <laughs> It, uh, it is good. Uh, I'm grateful that uh, Dr. Dave is on our panel. Ashley, I'm wondering too, as Dave uh, expounds upon some of these pitfalls of data, Ashley, in your consulting work, I'm wondering if, if you can think of uh, one pitfall that you have recently or recurrently been helping educators either avoid or mitigate uh, about their use of data. <laughs> So this is maybe a bigger concept than a pitfall, but I think like uh, Dave said, with the, with the leadership, it starts with them. Um, you have to look at the culture of the school and what the culture is about having conversations around data and how they empower teachers to have those conversations within a safe place um, where they feel secure about talking about the data and looking at it. And then they take that same environment back into the classroom. Um, I, I, I like the saying like happy teacher, happy classroom. So if a teacher is feeling stressed out or anxious about looking at data or reflecting on data, don't feel like that is something normal to their practice, then it's not going to be normal within their classroom and their students are going to feel the same way. So it, it kind of has to start at the top and comes down. Some of the things I've done with this is looking at pathway progressions rather than this is what we are, this is what we're not. So even and analyzing like readers workshop. We created like a pathway or a staircase of what, where we were, our reality of what was happening with readers workshop and then K through two classrooms and where our goal was. And we created like this stair step pathway of, okay, this is the next level for us. This is the next level for us. And then what are we gonna do to get there? And so we worked on this pathway to get to a place where we felt like it was functioning. Um, and then at that point, guess what? You start a new pathway for what's next. So I like to take the same concept with students in the classroom. When you're looking at reading ability or um, mathematical concepts, you can look at the math progressions of, you know, what's developmentally appropriate for the age group and having them track kind of where they are. So it kind of goes back to like Jen talking about, you know, it's a progress and you're working towards something. It's not infinite. And so I think using this idea of pathways gives you leniency where you're not judging them as pass or fail but that we are working towards a goal and we're collecting data to show what we know, what we don't know. Um, one of the things I used to do in the classroom when I taught um, project-based learning is it was very similar to your grid method. And we had certain levels of where we needed to get to complete the PBL. But within those, there was like a checkpoint. Well, if the checkpoint, they didn't feel like they were successful on that checkpoint, then we offered workshops 
So there's a lot of scaffolding and differentiation in there for students to then assess, okay, this, I wasn't ready for this part. So I'm going to go to a workshop with my teacher, which really was small group instruction, where we then helped them um, and guided them through whatever it was that they were struggling with. So then they could get to that next level. You know, I, I see uh, Dave taking notes over there. So I want to throw it back to him. And I know that we're going to wrap up our conversation soon and then move into those action steps that we're going to challenge our, our panelists here, including Brad Hughes, challenge our community of what we can all do to be better in this area. But Dave, I'd love to throw it at you uh, to see what, what notes you're taking over there. Maybe some points that you want to make sure you throw out before we wrap up our dialogue here. Oh man, no pressure here to, to make this short and sweet. No, but I, th I think we... We, we have to remember that the goal is for all of us to get better each and every day. Again, not, not for judgment. We've gotten ourselves to this place now where we are giving tests to predict future tests. Not so that we can make adjustments, because when we start to take these tests to predict future tests, all we're doing is saying that the teacher in the meantime doesn't matter. You give a test in the winter to predict what a spring summative assessment a score might look like. You're saying that there's not going to be instruction taking place for the next four months. It just it blows my mind. In, this, in September, we come up with strategic plans in our buildings and in our schools to say, these are the instructional initi initiatives we're going to be focusing on. Here are the pedagogical practices we're all going to be celebrating because we know it's best practice. But then we use these other test scores to judge the effectiveness as opposed to going into classrooms on a daily basis and guiding people in those practices that we all agreed on at the beginning of the year. That's, that's the data that we need to be collecting is how do we continue to stay focused and true to our course and make instructional shifts day to day Focus on in the moment instead of just casting judgment and blame and using these predictive patterns because correlation does not equal causation to start making assumptions about whether or not somebody's good, bad, or ugly. So there's my platform. I just have to scream it from the rooftops. Quit using data that you don't understand to blame the person that's doing the stuff that you don't have the time to go into the classroom to see. Boom. Mic drop right there. We are going to be right back for our take action segment. In this segment, we are going to go around to all of our panelists and have them challenge some action steps that we can all take maybe as soon as tomorrow or later this week to be just a little bit better in how we use data in our lives. This is going to be applicable to teachers that are listening, principals that are listening, superintendents that are listening, or anybody in our educational ecosystem. I'm so excited to hear from each and every one of you a little suggestion that you might have for this week. And then also we will make sure that you all know how to connect with our panelists here because they are incredible Teach Better family members that you absolutely should not end your conversations with here tonight. We'll be right back. Hey everyone, we're jumping back in with our take action section where we are going to kind of recap our conversation so far, give everyone an opportunity to give some actionable takeaways that you can implement this week involving our data discussion. And I want to start with Brad Hughes. Brad, I know that you've been an incredible facilitator this conversation. I love that you are able to have such a skill in getting people talking about their passion space but you also are a principal, an educator, and have, I'm sure, a great opinion on this. So what can you start off by challenging our community here to consider when it comes to data or data? Oh, Brad, you are muted. Come on, amateur move, co-host, buddy. Click the right button. Uh, data would suggest, I don't know how to unmute my microphone at the correct time, but limited data set, but uh, I'm uh, one for one. That'll be my mistake of the day. Uh, my challenge for the community, Ray, is uh, not to treat data collection as uh, a circus-style birthday party event. Uh, it, collecting data uh, means careful and daily attention, not only to what's going on around you, but also gathering information about the what so that you can turn it into the why. And for me, the why is better instruction. Uh, I think there can be a gap that we consider data as student shortfall or student, student learning gaps or student lagging skills. For me, the action is using data to reflect on and to inspire ourselves and others to teach more effectively what the students need to move those data points forward. So uh, as a school leader and as a classroom teacher previously, 
for me, it was always keeping the radar scanning for opportunities to learn more, to gather information about what's happening and what's not yet happening. But equally as important, Ray, I think it's about gathering the information about the human beings around us, uh, what they need from us as educators so that they can be inspired to learn and do and be just a little bit better every day. There's there's that third path that I like to talk about where it's not assessment or social emotional learning, assessment or relationships, assessment or meeting the needs of the little humans around us. But I, I think there's a path where we can assess and gather data while showing deep respect for and, and tremendous affection for the relationships in our classroom. Mm. Such a good thought-provoking moment to take with us this week. Jen, I'd love to throw it to you, a takeaway that you hope our our community has from this dialogue, maybe an action step they can take. Yeah, I think the one thing that we haven't really talked about is how realistically, how do teachers have time to do this? Mm -hmm. Um, And thinking about how, again, how we can be efficient with um, data collection and usage. Um, So I think that every teacher should do a data audit. Um, So taking like five minutes to jot down what data you're currently collecting. If you don't think you're collecting any, you probably are. So especially after this conversation, really thinking about, um, you know, where you are gaining information about uh, your students and Then the second question is, are you actually using it? So are you collecting data and then not doing anything with it? Um, And if so, are you not doing anything with it because it's useless data or because we're not necessarily being intentional with um, using that information? And then I would say um, it can feel very overwhelming because there is so much data that you can gather in a classroom. So for the next week, two weeks, month, choose one or two um, different pieces of information to focus on um, so that you're making sure you're collecting it and using it and it's informing your practice. Um, Because like many things in teaching, if you try to do everything, you're not going to do anything well. Um, So choosing one or two pieces of information that you're gathering, setting a goal like Ashley and Dave have talked about and, um, you know, focusing on that. I'm so excited to remind our crew here that you should all be connecting with our incredible panelists. Jen, just to give you a little shout out, I love following you on Instagram. I know you post a lot on TikTok, but I love when I get to see it on Instagram because I don't use TikTok. And all I do, Jen, is love your content because you're so focused on those action steps that seemingly, from everything I've watched, don't take more than five minutes. And with our very limited time frame, I just really appreciate your action steps that are super realistic. So if anyone's looking for a new follow, definitely go check out Jen Manley. She'll share her contact information here in a bit. Ashley, I'd love to head to you next and think about what what action steps our community can take, maybe um, a major takeaway from today. Yeah, I think I'm gonna go and go back to that, the idea of the culture of reflective practice um, and speak to the instructional leaders. I think we need a set an environment where we are feeding into not only the teacher's thinking brain, the analyzing the data, but also their feeling brain and making sure that they feel safe in that place um, so that they can look at that data and they don't feel judged. So the one action step that I would get give is to sit down and write three to four data analysis mindsets for what that looks like when you're working with your staff through the PLC Um, and really looking at your, your mission for your school and your why and aligning those in purpose so that you have a framework for what it looks like when you're reviewing data together in the PLC. A next step for that would be making PLC anchor statements. What would an ideal PLC look like when looking at this data and what pathway can you create to get to um, those ideal statements to have a PLC who collectively looks at that data, works together, grows together, and ultimately pushes it back into the classroom to give students the best learning experience that they can have and keep them learning and growing. Mm, Ashley, such a good suggestion there. And something I know is that with how you broke down each one of those steps, and you're going to have a lot of people messaging you for more of those details on how to do it. And you are always so eager to help other educators. So I appreciate you sharing that and also being open to people asking you about those nitty gritty questions because they're going to be eager to implement that 
very, very shortly here. Dave, any thoughts on action steps? I know you've been able to share so much value so far, but summary of our discussion, key takeaways, and then any challenge you want to leave our community with? Yeah, I'll first geek out a little bit for those of you that are craving some numbers, okay? So I'll, I'll, I'll give you some numbers. Those of you that are, that are fans of John Hattie's work who over the last 20 years have studied the things that matter most in education, came up with his 252 influences, the 252 things that matter most in schools. He created a list and ranked them all by effect size. In essence, anything with an effect size of 0.39 or better has a positive impact on students. Let me just give you a few things that we already know works. And I'll tie this all together. Number one, quality feedback, 0.7. Remember 0.39 is the magic number. This is a 0.7. Evaluations and reflections based on trust and transparency, 0.75. Not judgment, trust and transparency. Teacher credibility, in other words, trusting teachers to, to that they have the answers and they can figure things out, 0.9. And then collective teacher efficacy means teachers being able to make decisions that matter most collectively, not being good little cogs, not being compliant, but collective efficacy, like self-efficacy means I can tie my own shoes. I can change my own tires. Collective teacher efficacy, 1.57, which is huge. That research collectively tells us that 95% of the things that teachers do are good for kids. 95% of the things that teachers do are, are good for kids, which means we can take all this other stuff about using numbers to label good or bad and say, okay, we've got the number that says teachers are good. Put that to the side. Teachers are doing good work. We no longer have to use the numbers to figure out if they're good or bad. And now we can take some of the other stuff that we know works. We know relationships matter. We know that when teachers are able to connect with kids, it matters. So teachers, I'm going to give you a task really quickly that you can do tonight or this week to figure out how well you know your kids. And it has nothing to do with numbers. I want you to look at your class list of kids. If you're a secondary teacher, look at your first hour or your favorite hour of kids. Next to each kid's name, I want you to pretend that money is not an obstacle whatsoever. I want you to write down a birthday present that you could buy each of those kids that is unique and special to that kid. Something that when, if they were to open it, they'd say, wow, my teacher really knows me. And if there's a kid listed there that you can't do that for, that's your charge. That's your challenge. Because that's the kind of stuff that matters most. If you're an administrator, do the same thing for the teachers in your charge. Brad, Ray, I, I'm going to admit something that I've never admitted to you before. I've got your names on a list as well. And I do this for you guys. And I update it regularly because those are the things that add to connections. Those are the things that help all of those other drivers make a difference. It doesn't matter if you know if your kid's a 160 or a 172. What matters is if you know that kid as a kid, because then the kid will accept your feedback. They'll know that you're credible. They'll know that you love them and they'll listen to your instruction. Mm, such good suggestions here. Brad, does Dave have your address? I'm hoping that that present gets delivered sometime soon here. I'm really flattered to think that uh, Dave continues to reflect on what some of my favorite gifts might be. Talk about a gift. This conversation tonight, uh, Ray, with you, Jen Ashley, and Dr. Dave Schmidt has been a true gift, uh, not only to ourselves on this panel, but to anyone uh, listening live with us tonight or anyone that will be checking us out on the uh, replay and on our episode of Teach Better Talk podcast as well. So the gifts just keep on giving, right? Yeah. Do you mind if I do a little plug for all the fun things we've been able to mention so far really, really fast? Fantastic. First and foremost, friends, do not forget that our panels discussions typically mirror our theme for our admin mastermind that happens every single Tuesday at 9 a.m. Eastern. I think it's 8 a.m. Central for me. And uh, that's a free group where administrators can come together and talk shop. There's a theme every single month. And so if this is interesting to you, please consider uh, that free registration that's over at teachbrighter.com slash mastermind. We also mentioned our edupreneur mastermind, which I know many of us have partaken in. And specifically, I know Ashley and Jen are huge, wonderful voices in. That is a group for any educators that are pursuing a side hustle or are looking for some of that business perspective. There's so many good things there that's over on our website as well. You can learn more about. And then I have to give a shout out to Jen. She's a part of our speakers network, which is an opportunity to not only bring the Teach Better team to your school district, but bring an expert in the field like Jen connected to the team and bring her in to share her voice, her expertise, her workshops and everything else. You can get all of those details over at teachbetter.com slash speakers network. And last, 
but not least, Brad, I have to give a shout out for 12 hour live, which is less than a month away. Can you believe it, Brad? Ray, that is 720 minutes of free nonstop back to back uninterrupted professional learning and development brought to you by our Teach Better team and members of our Teach Better family, 12 hour live. The giveaways, the themes, the guests that are going to be a part of this conversation. Here's a little snippet of the schedule, but you can find the full schedule on any of our social media platforms that you follow. We'll be right back. Sunday weekly warm up. Before we run, I'd love to go through our panel one quick time to have you share how people can stay connected to you. Dr. Dave, I'm going to start with you and how can everyone stay connected and follow up with you if they, in case they have questions for you? Yeah, two, two primary ways. I'll give you three though. Got my social media handle right there. So it's at Dave Schmidt on, on all the things. You can also reach me via email if if you're old school, is email old school? I guess it is. Dave at teachbetter.com. And if you're really, really old school and you actually want to call me or text me, I'll give you my number, 734-377-3457. That's fast. But Dave Schmidt, all the things, you'll find me. I love it. Ashley, I'd love to head to you next, how people can stay connected, follow up with you if they have questions. Um, my website would probably be the best place to go, coachingaccess.net. On there, I have all my social media links and uh, contact me. Um and probably my biggest social media is Twitter. So you can hit me up there and send me a DM. So good. And Miss Jen Manley. All right. So um, my handle is Strategic Classroom. I'm mostly on um, TikTok and Instagram. Or you can shoot me an email at jenmanleyedu at gmail.com. Wonderful. If you have any issues connecting with these panelists, please know that we are very much connected to them and would love to help. You can reach out to Brad and I anytime. Brad, thanks again for an awesome show and a great panel you put together. This is why I love hosting with you. I love hosting with you too, Ray, and uh, talk about a powerhouse panel. Incredible discussion, but uh, I think even more importantly, incredible people with incredible hearts for kids and uh, incredible determination to improve the lives of educators that they're in contact with. So we're pleased to be in contact with Jen, Ashley, and Dave tonight, Ray, and very pleased to be part of your Sunday evening, whatever your important role in education might be, getting you ready for a great week ahead. Have a wonderful week, guys. We'll see you soon. Bye, friends.